the law is sometimes pretty stark, uh, pretty monochrome in, in what it suggests should happen. And that's often not what people want. Even the party who's in the more powerful position doesn't necessarily want to use the law to gain the upper hand, but by the same token they often are afraid to open the door a little bit because they think it might turn out to be opening the floodgates. So um, the collaborative process is one that's very good for be getting people to be able to take those small steps towards one another which they can't necessarily do in the more traditional or, or confrontational scenarios. I'm Julian McAvoy, I'm a family lawyer and collaboratively trained lawyer here at RHW Solicitors in Guildford. Um, I'm a partner here and I've been a family solicitor for most of my practicing career. Um, collaborative law is an interesting concept and one that fascinated me as soon as I found out about it because uh, it gives both of the parties an opportunity to remain in contact with one another uh, and to keep control of what's going on in their divorce or in their separation. Um, it's available for both married couples as well as separating couples who didn't have to be married. Um, but if your relationship has broken down, then it's potentially something for you. Um, why, why did it intrigue me? Well, because in my experience, an awful lot of separating couples don't necessarily hate one another full stop. There's often quite a residue of, of um, positive emotions that are still there somewhere, but they takes a they've gone to some considerable lengths to conceal the fact that they now still have positive feelings for one another and that's quite natural and quite easily understood if you stop to think about it. But often um, people will find that they have things in common still. For example, their children. Children are usually, almost without exception, the very most uh, important thing for them and resolving therefore their, their um, their separation or their divorce, but keeping the children in as good a place as possible is always a very high priority. Um, and, and as I say, if people feel they still have some res residue of goodwill towards one another, then maybe they don't want to go down the traditional, um, the traditional route of having to fight it out in court, which I've always found to be terribly unsatisfactory. It's a complete waste of everyone's time and notoriously solicitors' bills get very, very high. And that's because solicitors have to do an awful lot of work. What's it all about? Well, really, it's not really proving an awful lot. It's just proving that um, two people can face up to one another in court if they have to. So there are far more productive and positive ways of going about things. And that's what attracted me to collaborative law in the first place. The collaborative process is, is good for all sorts of profiles. Um, but financially, um, it can be available for those who have literally no asset base whatsoever because their priority may not be to worry about the financial assets. They may be worrying about something else entirely, such as, for example, the best way in which to go about the divorce process or, for example, about their children, in which case finances needn't feature at all in the discussions. Um, but it is also, as a tool, it's very, very good for sorting out more complex financial cases. So um, where there are, for example, a, a lot of additional considerations that you wouldn't necessarily find in, in a run-of-the-mill case, it can sometimes be helpful to be able to say, OK, we need to take a, uh, an unorthodox view of all this. We need to maybe set quite a long time frame for things to happen, for things to work themselves out and so on. So um, it's not necessary for collaborative law that it should have a complex financial background, but it's good for those cases. You don't need to be friends with your partner, the one with whom you are separating. And that would be unrealistic, wouldn't it? Because Clearly, part of the nature of the beast is you're about to uh, end a, a, an association of some years or sometimes many decades, um, and that really happens without there being some loss of friendship. Um, so you don't have to like one another necessarily. It does help, but you don't have to. Traditionally, um, 
quite often it would lead the solicitors and the parties to having to go to court uh, and if you go to court then there's a lot of time and effort involved and that equates to a lot of legal bills but also incredible stress I mean, because you don't know what's going to happen next even even the solicitors and the professionals don't really know what's going to happen next um, so any alternative is, is better than that in, in my view uh, and collaborative law does give you that uh, that different alternative um, is it available for everybody? Um, I don't know that it is actually but there are some cases where people have come to the conclusion that they uh, they are so opposed to one another that they're unable to see the wood for the trees and, and in those cases probably it's best not to try and um, make people go into agreements where they're clearly not mentally attuned to it um, and if anyone's trying to hide something and sometimes people are uh, if they're trying to hide their their assets um, then collaborative law is not good. You, you have to be able to go into it on the basis of trust. So it's for those cases where there is trust and there's some understanding of the other party's position and a desire on the part of both of the parties to, to try and make a go of it and to try and be positive about it.